Over 20 years ago, there was no season of Kamen Rider on the air. Kamen Rider Black RX was the last season that had been released, and Kamen Rider J was the last piece of media period, both of which were still considered part of Kamen Rider's Showa era. At this point in time, Kamen Rider was essentially dead, and it didn't really have any signs of returning to its former glory. But then, in 2000, on the empty planet, the legend was repainted from zero. Kamen Rider was brought back in full force with a new hero that transformed the franchise with his massive array of new forms, foes, and allies. The Kamen Rider franchise would not be where it is today if it wasn't for this hero, if it wasn't for Kamen Rider Kuga. So today I'm here to review Kamen Rider Kuga the show. I have a lot of thoughts on this season, mostly good, but before I can get to it, be sure to let me know your thoughts on the season of Kuga. If you have seen it, of course. If you haven't, know that I will be going into heavy spoilers for the season, so you may want to go check back for Kuga's writer potential episode where I will go over its aesthetics and how it could be adapted. Or just go watch the entirety of Kuga and then come back and watch this video since it is a great season so but this isn't about the aesthetics though it's all about the story and characters of the season and once again since there's a lot to go over in both aspects let us begin so I want to start this whole discussion with like a semi disclaimer sort of thing which is just sort of the mature tone Kuga has overall it incorporates a few horror elements with the villains and the fights have this raw, intense aspect to them as well. There's not a lot of blatant humor as well, it gets more subtly placed into the background if it's even there in an episode at all, and the show just feels eerily different from the more recent seasons, which are the ones that I'm personally more experienced with. So this is one of my favorite aspects of the season, but it feels kind of unfair to go in so much detail about it because this season was meant as a revival for the franchise, so of course it gets sort of weird and experimental and ends up different from the other seasons, along with the fact it was just made 20 years ago and the times have changed. However, modern seasons have shown that if needed, they can more or less match the tone of the season, so it's not like Kuga is wholly unique in this aspect, it's just more unique in that the whole season permeates with this aspect. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that unfairly, one of my favorite parts of Kuga is its dramatically different tone compared to modern seasons, but because that's kind of unfair, I'm really not going into more detail beyond this little paragraph that I have just read on my computer. So with that out of the way, there is still so much I love in Kuga. Let's start with our hero characters that I think all play off of each other really well. I think one of the most interesting parts of the season is that they all strike this balance between personality and development as a character. For example, starting with John and the uncle, they arguably don't really have much going for their characters in terms of story, but it's totally made up with their personalities. These are probably my two favorite side characters just because they have so much energy and are so much fun on screen and that really makes all their scenes enjoyable. I think that's more apparent in the case of the uncle because I may just have some personal bias with John because in his first appearance he speaks a lot of English so I was hoping he would be a main character after he appears and he does. So it was basically just wish fulfillment, that's probably the only reason I really like him. The uncle actually does get a few cool scenes as well with his niece, I think? Then we have a lot of characters that have pretty much the same amount of personality and character focus. Nana is more of a personality type, but her interactions with her uncle are a lot of fun, and in some cases they actually provide an insight on the world of Kuga, something I think that is really useful with these side characters. Minori is basically the same thing, except you switch the uncle with Yusuke. She's basically mostly just a fun personality type, but there are a few instances where she has some character focus or health with other characters focus. Tsubaki, the doctor, is kind of the opposite in that he has a few moments of personality for me by being a flirt, but he also just has a lot of character focus by acting more as this vessel of developing other characters and spreading the knowledge that he himself has learned. Similarly, Enokita has this really interesting backstory of reconnecting with her son that operates mostly in the background of the entire season until almost the end with John, so hey, he does get some character stuff to do. I'd really like the relationship these two built over 
the course of the show, it felt really natural and heartwarming when it all wrapped up. Whether I'm talking about Anokita and John or Anokita and her son, I will let you decide since it's the same in both cases. Then we have some characters on the complete opposite spectrum that, in my opinion, don't really have that much personality but are integral parts of the story due to their character developments. My least favorite character in this category and honestly in the entire show is that one missing kid from like that one single arc. He appears in these episodes, his insight on the world of Kuga is not really that useful at all, and then he's gone and never appears again. Okay, <laughs> completely opposite of this on the complete opposite spectrum are the other three that are actually really useful in my opinion. The first is Mika and she provides a great insight on how the Grongi are affecting life with how her father was one of the first victims at the hands of the Grongi and Daguva and she hates Kuga and the police before she chooses to move forward with them and work with John and from there she actually becomes a somewhat recurring character assisting with the retrieval of Goram, taking part in another focus arc and eventually getting a wrap up off screen mentioned in the finale, I think. Another off-screen wrap-up was received by Junichi, the artist guy. <laughs> he arguably had some of the best focus episodes, I think. His first insight on the Grongi's effects was how certain people may perceive them as a heroic force, maybe even worshipping them. When we later see him again, after he's moved past that arc of his life, he's still not fully complete as a person, as he still doesn't understand what it means to have a life. And this is once again taught to him by Tsubaki, the Doctor. Junichi isn't really my favorite character on screen, but I won't deny at all that I think his stories in the season are really the most interesting. The last character like this is Kanzaki, the teacher, but that's honestly a bit of a loose definition because he makes the most recurrences of these seemingly one-off characters and he ties a lot into Kuga himself. I really loved the fact that he taught Yusuke the thumbs up that he has embraced as his symbol throughout his entire life and it really makes him feel the most impactful out of all these side characters, especially the one-offs. Well, even then, they're not really one-offs because, again, they do go on to make some recurrences in the season after they debut, and they help with the world building of the season. All of these side characters are great in different and unique ways. I love their different personalities, the way they all interact with each other, except the one kid that I really didn't like that episode. But, of course, they are all massively overshadowed by the three main characters. At the bottom of these three, in my opinion, is Sakurako. And it's just because she doesn't really do much in the season other than translate all the Linto text. I think she was at her peak when she was out and about translating this text and uncovering the mysteries of Kuga since that was very central to her character and the story and it was really quite interesting to see. Her interactions with Yusuke are also very fun as well because they have known each other for so long and it created another one of my favorite scenes in the show after Yusuke dies and she is completely unfazed knowing that he will return in some way. She's certainly integral to the show as the translator, but other than that, there's nothing about her that really stands out to me beyond a few great interactions. Up next is Ichijo and the entirety of the police that I'm going to talk about together. Also, apparently his first name isn't Ichijo, but like no one calls him Kaoru, and the same thing goes for Kuga from this point on, I'm calling him Godai. I love the connection that the show gives with the police, Kuga, the Grongi, and the bike. Here's how I saw things in the season. The partnership between Godai and Ichijo begins with the bike. It was manufactured for police use and Ichijo gives it to Kuga to demonstrate that he believes in Godai as a hero. This bike is really the foundation for their trust for each other and so many interactions in the season. But beyond that, in the real world, the rider machine is a symbol of a common rider. It is literally what makes him a masked rider. So this moment of Ichijo giving Godai the bike as a symbol of trust is also a symbol of Ichijo creating a new legend and creating Kamen Rider history. Afterwards, the interactions between Godai and Ichijo are great. I love Ichijo as the tragic straight man whose personality bounces so well off of the happy Godai. It makes those moments where he does have a bit more to say that much more fun. But they also both still feel very connected in their tragic pasts and their desire to help others with 
Ichijo pretty much always being with Godai in his fights, despite the lack of any actual Kamen Rider armor. It adds a lot of stakes to the fights of the season because you know there's someone there truly risking his life. Ichijo is like a reverse of the typical secondary rider trope nowadays in that he has the heart of a rider, just no armor. And that's a really interesting twist and I personally think it makes him stand out among just the literal secondary riders. There are more stakes in each battle because he's just a normal human battling almost on the same level Kuga is in armor. It's another aspect that makes Ichijo such an interesting person and a great parallel to Godai. I'm glad that he became Kamen Rider Gates at some point according to the Gates Majesty Ride Watch that depicts Gates in Kuga's spot because Ichijo is truly this season's secondary. But even though Kuga and Godai have created this wonderful relationship, obviously there isn't this trust created with the rest of the police force. Kuga is still just a vigilante fighting on the streets. Who cares if there's one police officer that is friends with him? So how does he become a full-fledged member of the police, basically an all-but-name? Of course, by facing off against his most powerful foe yet, who functions as an evil double complete with his own bike and steals Kuga's, which, as I mentioned earlier, is his symbol as a common rider. The police force, or at least the characters that we know in it, unite together much like Ichijo did in trusting Kuga and return his symbol as a hero back to him, this time improved and better than ever so that he can strike down the false hero that has stolen his symbol. And from that point on, they all work very closely together and develop more of the season's plot. I love that so much. I think Ichijo and the police in this season are handled extremely well, and I really love how everything plays out between them and with Godai and the bike. That's probably not an intentional like symbol they were trying for in the season, but I thought it was cool. I don't know. <laughs> But of course, everything with every character connects together so well because of Kamen Rider Kuga himself, Yusuke Godai. Godai is such a simple but great character. Right from the beginning of the show, he has to go on a mini character arc to unlock the true power of Kuga in the mighty form, acquiring the full determination to protect his friends and the smiles of the world. It's integrated so well with Kuga's aesthetics as well by creating a switch from the plain growing form to the powerful, iconic mighty form. Every fight is already an example of Godai's growth as a person and how much of a hero he truly is. And with every fight where Godai struggles, we see how his beliefs push past the villainy and in the end, always prevail. Usually, we see our writers begin with heroic ideals and learn to grow and expand them throughout the season, but I feel that's a different case here. Godai finishes out a main arc in episode 2 really, and even before the season, he's already a common writer in heart and doesn't really grow much as a person beyond that. But I don't see that as a problem. First of all, Godai is already so much fun, so I mean, that's great, what more do you want? But along with that, his never changing good hearted personality is also the glue that holds together the rest of our main cast in the season. Godai is the reason Minori helps the kids, the reason Mika moves past her tragedy, the reason John and Enokita reconcile, the reason Tsubaki helps Junichi, the reason Sakuraku is always confident, and the reason Ichijo was able to defeat the Grongi. Godai's pure is why the other characters strive to be the best they can be or help others be the best they can be because Godai is already at his best. This is where I think Kuga really shines as a character and really cements him as one of my favorite primary writers of all time. From his iconic thumbs up, to his unwavering dedication, to how he really makes this season's characters work, Godai is awesome. It makes me sad knowing that I won't ever be able to see how he inspires the later generations of writers in person, because the way he inspires his friends in this season was amazing and the best part of this season character-wise. And it's a good thing that all the characters are such strong characters, because the villains aren't really characters at all. Now, if you're expecting me to spend the next few minutes going over why I don't like the Grongi, you are completely wrong, because I love the Grongi. This is one of the coolest idea for a faction of villains I've ever seen, coupled with one of the coolest evolutions of a faction. When we first see the Grongi, they really just seem like mindless monsters killing for no reason, you know, your normal monsters of the week. But one thing I noticed upon my first watch was... Was the Japanese being translated wrong? Huh? I was generally confused about what was going on with the subtitles at first. I thought something had bugged out with them, but then I realized the Grongi are speaking a different language. Once I 
realize this, I still thought it was a bit of a strange idea as there are a lot of scenes of the Grongi just talking to each other in their language and you can't understand anything, or at least it's harder to understand for someone who can't understand the language of what all the other characters speak as well. So I thought this was really just a waste of time until about 10 episodes into the season, the Grongi begin to speak Japanese, or in the world of subtitles it meant their subtitles were actual English. So then we actually get a decent amount of scenes where the Grongi start using English subtitles to communicate with each other, and that's how we start to learn the nature of their plans and such. It's really such a natural way to reveal villain plans. It allows for scenes with the Grongi where we still get to see what they're up to, but we don't get anything more on their plans specifically, and then we have scenes that give more of an explanation. It's also a cool way to show how our villains are growing and evolving, becoming more adapted to the world they have been placed into so they can continue their game. This is also represented in their forces and attacks on Kuga, as seasons usually do, but I find the Grongi's growing power levels slightly more interesting. Since they were playing a game, it makes sense that they would get progressively stronger and more organized. At first, the monsters all count their kills themselves with their weird bracelets and largely speak in their language. Then, as they begin to learn about the world around them, they start to use Japanese and evolve their game by now taking on their own unique strategies and have their kill counts taken in by a higher member of the organization. This is really just another case of a stupid small gimmick, but I love it. It's a really cool and unique way to evolve a villain faction as a whole over the course of a season instead of just developing characters, so I don't think it's much of a deal breaker if the Gronky are subtitled. But that's not to say that individual members are bad. As I mentioned, I love how they each have different strategies for the game and it makes a lot of later episodes each feel different and unique something I always like to see. It's also interesting to see how Godai and Ichijo adapt to the different situations each Gronki presents. The two main standouts for me are Gadoru and Bada. Gadoru is just really badass. I love his design and just the basic idea of him being in another Kuga, not you, with the same powers is pretty awesome. That makes his main arc of appearance just as amazing in my opinion because the fight scenes are pretty unique looking at the series overall. Along the same lines is Bada. I prefer this guy over over Gadoru because of the idea behind him is just kind of insane. He's 100% an Ichigo reference with his green colors, red scarf, and he's just chilling on a bike all the time, which is awesome in and of itself. He's the only Grongi who decided to get around in style. And as a result, we get bike fights. Bike versus bike. <laughs> all of the other rider seasons I've seen personally don't use their bikes that often, so seeing a season where it's not only used a lot, but is also an integral part of multiple fights in the season is so cool and it's so stupid and I love it. And it's thanks to Bada. This guy's four episode main appearance in Kuga is my favorite set of episodes in the season. It combines crazy cheesiness I expect from Toku, amazing story beats and emotion, and just plain awesomeness. Bada is awesome. Of course we have larger villains that have more impact on the season's story and I didn't really latch onto them as much but I think they're pretty cool. My favorite part of Baruba is that she's pretty much the main villain for the entire show by organizing the events of the game and whatnot, but instead of being this rival to Kuga as the main character as you would think, she instead develops a rivalry with Ichijo. It certainly assists with making Ichijo feel like a prominent part of the show, and I appreciate that Ichijo is the one that delivers the killing blow to fulfill the story. I also like the minor detail of how her dress changes depending on what tribe of Grongi is partaking in the game, another cute little aspect. But of course, the main villain of Kuga is his arch rival and evil clone, Endagu. Zeba. And despite Dagova being another one of those villains that doesn't really do anything until basically the finale, I like him. First of all, he's obviously not entirely last minute because he's right there in episode 1 and causes everything in the season and there's build up to his appearance, so he's not really thrown in there. His personality is also quite a bit of fun too by kind of just not caring about anything. He's always just sort of chilling and this adds to the gravitas he brings when he's on screen. He's literally so powerful, he just knows he's always going to win. Almost always. I also really like his connection to Kuga as a clone of him, as it's another assist in raising the snakes and also just gives him a really badass design. A great parallel to ultimate form as well for that final battle. And a great parallel to Godai as a character, where they're both very carefree with everything they're doing, but Godai is carefree so that he can have the determination to protect everyone's smiles, whereas Daguva is carefree because he just doesn't really care about anything. <laughs> So, there you go. 
So my favorite and least favorite part of Kamen Rider Kuga is the pacing of the season overall. This season knows how to take its time with plot points and I love it. Of course we've got a standard two episode formula, but well, I guess at the time it wasn't really the standard. But Kuga does a good job of continuing plot points beyond just the single two episode arcs and it's so good. The first time this really stuck out to me was with Goram, beginning as this small subplot with John and Mika before it becomes this really small cameo throughout episode 13. And then it got a full debut multiple episodes later, creating this great build-up to the appearance of Kuga's ancient ally. Later on, when we get the death of Kuga in an arc I like to call Go Die, <laughs> At the end, of course, he comes back to life in an epic way, but now we start to lay the seeds of his growing power by giving growing form the power to Rider Kick, and then the electric bursts that appear over the course of the next several episodes before Godai finally unlocks the powers of Rising. And then we get a great parallel to the early episodes of the season by giving each Rising form a new pair of episodes to debut that leads up to Rising Mighty, and then the preceding four episodes that deal with its fallout, as I mentioned earlier, and a great mix up for the formula of the show. The show does a great job of just mixing up formulas to make certain arcs stand out and feel unique alongside giving stories room to breathe and fully develop. My favorite example of this is the aforementioned build up to Rising, but I think the best example is actually Daguva in Ultimate Kuga. Daguva cameos in the beginning to get everything moving, and then disappears with the occasional mention here and there or someone watching the tapes of his attack. Alongside this are warnings of the power of the Arkle and the effect it could have on Godai's mind build up this sense of dread. These minor mentions serve well until episode 35, where the mystery behind Daguva begins to surface and Kuga Ultimate begins to approach with these awesome flashbacks I was not expecting at all. It helps to add to the foreboding atmosphere until the end of the show, which is alright in my opinion. Upon first watch, I hated how Kuga Amazing gets only a few seconds of usage before being tossed aside a fight scene we don't even get to fully see. However, I did like the buildup it provided for the final fight before the final fight was just a two minute punching match. Now, I went back to the first fight with Amazing Mighty and Dagova while writing this review, and after context that it wasn't just some sort of flash forward like I originally thought, I do like the idea behind this a lot more now, as it creates this amazing sense of finality for the season, and you can really feel the dread all the other characters had. I still would have liked to have more scenes with Amazing Mighty to show its power levels a bit more before going against Dagova, and that's mainly where I think the show taking its time takes a fall. It feels a bit rushed to go straight from Amazing amazing to ultimate because so much time was spent building up to it. Speaking of ultimate, it honestly feels like a bit of a letdown in the final fight. After all this tension about the power of ultimate and whether or not Kuga would be able to control it or use it properly, or if Kuga would succumb to the will of the Grongi, he just uses ultimate without anything happening and everything goes to plane without a hitch. Seriously? Then that final fight is just a bunch of punches between the two power kings. I don't know what that phrase is, I guess we'll leave it in. And this part is really disappointing because all of the fights in this season had this really cool aspect, they were all long and drawn out and had this awesome impact to every punch. This one has the impact, but nothing else, I feel. Given the time, I didn't need some big special effects thing, I just kind of wanted a little bit more. Maybe a quick second where Gold Ice comes to the darkness, but then remembers what he's fighting for and switches back. Maybe a, a kick as opposed to a punch, <laughs> I don't know, some something to switch it up. I was just overall disappointed with the finale of Kuga, and this one is a fully opinionated thing, unlike other certain final bosses. I can see the appeal in the minimalist aspect of this finale. It is certainly impactful, and it has a very cool stylistic choice to end the season. It's just not for me. I hate to end on such a negative, so uh, here's a joke. Another aspect where Kuga takes too much time to do something is in a lot of sequences that are just establishing shots that go way longer than they should. I don't need to see this kid walking around for 5 minutes or see the Grongi talk to each other in their language for 10. Just a thought, nothing, nothing really bad at all. Kamen Rider Kuga's impact on the world of Kamen Rider is undeniable. Obviously it brought back the franchise to its television roots and revived it in a completely unprecedented way. But beyond that, Kuga has added so many new tropes into the series. Even if he wasn't the first writer to have form changes, he was the first one to have an abundance of them and have the story revolve around them. He introduced a two episode arc staple to the Heisei era and reintroduced a villain faction with ties to the hero. The impact of Kuga isn't necessarily creating all these new 
new ideas for the Rider franchise, it's utilizing them in a new way as the start of a new era. Personally, I loved Kamen Rider Kuga. I loved the characters and the way they all interacted with each other. I loved the way they all play into the plot and the unique villains. And I love the overall tone and the way this season differentiates itself from the rest of Kamen Rider, even if it's just the circumstances around its creation. Even though I think it left off on a bit of a low note and had a few hiccups along the way, this season of Kamen Rider is fantastic and will certainly go down as one of my personal favorites. Comparing it to the other seasons of Kamen Rider I've seen so far, I'm putting it in third place, right behind Bill. I'm personally just a bigger fan of Bill's fast pace storytelling compared to the slow burn of Kuga, but Kuga utilizes that form of storytelling so well that I think it beats out the other seasons for me. I really enjoyed the season, and I'm happy it's so easily accessible to US viewers on Tokushatsu and will hopefully be more accessible to others. If you haven't seen the season and you've watched the end, I still highly recommend this season. It's really good. As I mentioned at the beginning, if you want to hear my thoughts on the aesthetics of the season and how I would adapt it, be on the lookout for that Rider Potential episode, and also consider checking out some of my other season reviews if you're interested for more of those thoughts. But for now, be sure to let me know your thoughts on the revival of Kamen Rider down in the comment section, and I hope to see you next time. Thank you for watching.